usually go by Tony. I'm the moderator today for this webinar. The topic of our webinar is CEFR E2M EMI best practice. First of all, on behalf of the Department of Foreign Language Instruction and Wenzhou, I would like to welcome and thank you for being here with us today. And secondly, uh, please allow me to walk you through the rules of this webinar very quickly. Uh, I will share my slides. Uh, number, rule number one, uh, you are welcome to ask questions in question and answer or the chat box at the button of your screen. Number two, to receive the e-certificate, please complete a survey after the web docs before 24th August uh, Taiwan Standard Time. Number three, you will receive the, the e-certificate approximately a week after the, uh, the web docs. Number four, uh, web docs handouts will be shared with you together with the e-certificates. Those are the simple rules of our webinar today. And before we move on, I would like everyone to join us for a very quick icebreaking activity. As you can see on the screen, please type your answer for what kind of Taiwanese food do you want to introduce to the foreign speakers today, since there are two foreign speakers uh, in our webinar today. Would you please type your answer very quickly uh, in the chat box at the bottom of your screens, okay? So I will stop sharing and type uh, the questions to all people. Yeah, I see more uh, answers coming up, like sashima in, Ch uh, in Chinese, tofu pudding, so so fun. Okay, thank you, thank you. I believe uh, those foreign speakers can 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 uh, take those <laughs> answers in. Hi, Tom. Welcome to join us. Okay. Um, thank you. I see more answers coming up. Uh, we are doing this because we want to make sure that every, everyone knows the chat function and can actively participate in today's webinar. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, well, more answers are coming up. Um, as you know, there are four sections in total in our webinar. But before we get to the first section, Let's welcome Adrian Rapper from Clarity English to give us some welcome remark. Adrian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Well, it's uh, it, it's very good to be at least talking to Taiwan again from Hong Kong. I was hoping we'd be able to come and uh, come over and see. We've for so many years we've been. Uh, privilege to work with Taiwanese universities uh, and institutions um, using Clarity English software and um, working on projects together, especially with uh, Wen Zhao. Um, and it's our great pleasure to be able to support this kind of uh, professional development um, unit. So when, um, when, when Zhao sort of started talking about uh, CEFR and bilingualism and, and asked us if we, uh, if we knew anybody who, who would be able to have some good input on this. Uh, our thoughts immediately went to, um, first of all, uh, Sean McDonald from TELC, who as the uh, premier European language testing experts um, deal a lot with CFR and bilingualism. And then Tom Jones, who is a living, walking expert in so many languages, um, both intensely practical um, and with a, uh, a hidden intelligence in there. So it's our, it's our great pleasure to, um, to be able to bring these people along um, with uh, Janet and Antonia from uh, Wen Zhao. Um, so, without further ado, let me welcome you from Clarity English and hand back over to Tony. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, all right, let's get to the juicy parts. Our first presenter is uh, Dr. Sean McDonald. Sean is a project manager on English assessment from Talk Language Test. 
He is going to talk about the meaning of the CFR B2 for Taiwan teachers and students. Let's welcome Sean. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Sean McDonald, uh, and I'm glad to be here and glad to meet you. I'm actually, uh, as we're doing this, as we're getting ready, I was just looking at the chat here, uh, and uh, I see some things that I know, pineapple cake, mango, uh, and what did I see? A few things I have never seen. Pearl milk tea, never had that. That looks like it might be interesting. Oyster omelet, <laughs> also looks good. That's always the great part about traveling, trying new food. Well, I'd like to jump into uh, my presentation. So let's take a look here. Just one moment, please. Today, we're talking about uh, the Sefer B2 and EMI best practice. <clears throat> uh, an interesting topic for today, of course, and I hope that I can um, add something to the discussion for you. First of all, uh, this is what I'd like to look at during my time with you. Um, I tell you a little bit about TELC, what I do, what we do. <clears throat> I think it's interesting uh, when we talk about B2, the Sefer B2, um, not only what it is, but we also consider what our stakeholders are. I'm a, um, an assessment specialist, I'm a test developer. Uh, we test at TELC worldwide. Um, and we have to remember exactly who our stakeholders are. The next uh, thing I'd like to talk to you about today is uh, why we're looking at B2. Sefer is, uh, as you know, um, more than just B2. Then I'd uh, like to look at uh, what B2 means for us across Europe, the work we're doing. Um, take a closer look at the level. Then I'd like to go back uh, and take a look at, at the Sefer in general. Um, and from there, we can go into the... Uh, the four skills and why we're looking at that. And if you have a moment uh, before we get started, uh, I found a, a nice picture of Frankfurt. This is uh, Frankfurt, Germany. This is where we're located. Mm, I guess you can't see our office here, but uh, we would be all the way over on the right, um, not too far, about a five minute walk from this bridge that you see in the foreground. Good. Well, who am I <laughs> to be sitting here and, and uh, talking to you? My name is Sean McDonald. I've uh, been a, a test developer at TELC Language Tests for um, over 10 years now. Um, and I come originally from uh, the University of California, from California. Um, before I came to TELC, I was working for the German Air Force. So I was doing, a, um, of course, a, a lot of testing of soldiers, assessment uh, in, in uh, NATO. We have uh, STANAC, what they call the standard uh, STANAC levels, standard agreement levels uh, across Europe, um, which I'm not going to mention actually in this talk. But I, I think it's also interesting that also in NATO, uh, we're looking at, uh, they don't use the CEFR in NATO, but also similar levels. Uh, across the board to get the, the soldiers from the different countries, from the different member states uh, speaking at the same level and speaking across languages. Um, but I'll, I'll get to uh, speaking across languages as we move along. Uh, more about me, uh, not only, I, I think it'll come up in, in this talk and, and maybe in our discussion afterwards, um, how um, specialized language, how English for specific purposes, uh, fits into the, the equation. And I, I did also a lot of that for soldiers. We talked, uh, well, we have military English, of course. Uh, more importantly, we have uh, aviation English uh, for, for aviators. As you may know, um, pilots across the world have to speak English. Uh, that's the language for flight controllers, for pilots flying around the world, and also for, um, for the Navy, for naval communications. <clears throat> um, and as I said, I'm talking to you here from Frankfurt today, uh, a bit of a chilly day. Uh, it's eight o'clock. Well, I guess it's a little past eight now in the morning, 10 minutes past eight, um, and we'll get started. 
Um, first thing that I'd like to consider is who our stakeholders are. Um, and the stakeholders, I think, is a, a really important question um, because for language testing and for teaching, we really have to consider who's involved in it, who are the stakeholders. Now, I think uh, we all know to start off with, oops, sorry, uh, the number one stakeholder, the, the stakeholder we see the most are the students out there. Those are the people taking the test when we look at. But we sometimes forget all the other people who really uh, are stakeholders in this SEFR level. And what I mean uh, as stakeholders, how are they involved in the process? Uh, if a student achieves his level B2 or he doesn't achieve it, of course, it's important for the student. Who else is a stakeholder in this process? Of course, the teachers are stakeholders um, in, in different ways. Uh, teachers are involved, um, sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a negative way too. Uh, I think it's it's important for the teacher to, to see their role, to see their path um, in this development, uh, in this language learning process. Of course, parents are stakeholders. In many cases, they're the ones paying for it. But not only that, emotionally, stakeholders as well, right? They're the ones that, uh, well, really get involved with their, their students. And uh, as we all know, parents go to great lengths to uh, make sure that their kids that their children do well. Administrators are stakeholders, right? Uh, the administrators are the ones they have to look, they have to check uh, the certification, the language certification the, the uh, test takers have or the, the students have. They have to follow up on it, they have to verify results, um, and they have to answer to their bosses as well, right? Good. Institutions, of course, are stakeholders. They want their students and their teachers to uh, all be at level. They have integrity to think about. They have their qualifications to think about um, and all their rules. So absolutely uh, important stakeholders, institutions. Employees are stakeholders. I think sometimes we forget uh, because we work so much with students, but um, this language assessment, uh, especially at level B2 or C1, hugely important for uh, a person's career. And as I'll demonstrate um, shortly, the um, employer in many cases or more and more cases uh, want to see proof of a language level B2, C1, right? Policymakers, also stakeholders, they're the ones that uh, decide what needs to be done. For example, uh, here in Germany, policymakers have determined uh, that people like me uh, who come to Germany and want to live here in Germany have to uh, demonstrate language ability. <clears throat> Not only to, uh, if, if I wanted to get a German citizenship, I would have to take a German test at level B2. <laughs> Uh, once again, level B2, uh, but also even if I wanted to uh, just live in this country or, um, or work in this country, I would still have to take a German test to demonstrate my language ability. <clears throat> the funny thing about that, uh, just a, a little side note on myself, is that I've been, I've been in Germany long enough um, that I, I came before they, they started this rule. That, and so I've been living here and I've never had to take a German test. Although my German is okay, I can I can order myself a beer and a Bratwurst, and I'll be fine, right? Uh, last but probably most important in all of this are the governments as stakeholders uh, making the rules on this. Now, one thing I'd like to point out is a rule for uh, for us as uh, developers of language testing, as assessors, as people who are uh, making these tests. And mostly these tests are uh, language tests for level two are, are what we call uh, um, high stakes tests. That means they're really important. They're very, uh, they can change a person's life, right? I mean, that's what we mean. They can really, they can determine what job you get. They can determine what university you go to. Um, things like that. So we really have to forget, uh, we not forget, but never forget uh, that language testers really have to always consider the potential effects, um, the short-term effects and the long-term effects 
uh, of all stakeholders with our uh, assessment, with what, what we're doing, right? Um, we always, and we always have to think about the, um, the test taker uh, in all of this. And we have to think about the, uh, the stakeholders, right? Um, and I, I think what we really want all of us, uh, you as teachers and we as uh, test developers, uh, is we're, we're always looking to find the best um, in a student or in a test taker as well, right? Good. We always want them to show us what they can do, uh, which I really like about this effort, talking about can-do statements. Great. Well, let's uh, hop right into it. Um, this is what we're talking about today, the uh, the Sefer global scale. <clears throat> this is kind of the, uh, the 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 start of our Sefer. I, I think this is the, the the one reference or the one page in, in this thick book. I think I have it here somewhere. Um, in this thick book uh, that we look at uh, is our global scale, right? And what we're looking at today, and I'd like to 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 just to take a minute to show to you is. Um, Oops, clicking around a little bit. Excuse me. What we're looking at today um, is the global scale for level B2, which looks like this, right? And I'd like to take you, uh, give you just one moment to look at that and read it through. Good. You had a moment to look at it. I've, uh, I, I try to do this, especially um, as a, a test developer. I tried to highlight a few words that that uh, really stuck out for me. Um, level B two. We're looking at complex topics, right? Complex texts. We're getting into a level of complexity beyond to just to go back. Um, beyond uh, the basic users, getting into a level of complexity, uh, getting into abstract language, right? Um, and also, in, and I think this is also important for you in academia, we're talking about uh, abstract topics, abstract topics in your field of specialization, right? Furthermore, at a B2, what we expect from B2, uh, we, we really don't expect native fluency at B2, but we do expect a degree of fluency and spontaneity that makes regular interaction with a native speaker uh, very possible, very easy, very unproblematic for us, right? And of course, um, <clears throat> at level B2, we're looking at a wide range of subjects. And you probably notice uh, how it goes up in the separate levels, um, starting with, with very basic things. I, I think of my, I don't know, Spanish that I speak and maybe I can order a beer and, and some food uh, where I'm really focused on very personal, very now things, get a bus ticket. Uh, whereas level B2, you can uh, go into a variety of subjects. You can go into detailed information. You can talk about um, abstract things. Um, which goes really beyond uh, the basic users here. Good. Then, how are we using B2 across Europe? Um, mainly, I, I mentioned um, specific language purposes such as military or aviation. However, uh, here across Europe, we're looking at these main areas where B2 is required. Of course, for university entrance, for, um, for any kind of civil service job, uh, for general job placement, right? And of course, um, <clears throat> different assessment centers uh, that we have. So B2 and to a lesser extent C1, depending on the country, uh, has really become the, the main 
level that people are looking for. That's that's the start. That's that's where people want to see your language ability, uh, where people feel that you have a professional capacity at that level to interact um, across Europe, um, and also where you have uh, where people feel with a level B two you have a uh, an academic ability to uh, be successful in your studies. <clears throat> One moment. I'd like to show you a couple of examples, uh, what we do at TELC um, and how it's being used across Europe <clears throat> and uh, yeah, what B2 looks like. To start off with, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a huge country for uh, language assessment is Hungary. Here we can see um, Parliament, I believe. Tom, isn't that the view from our hotel? Tom and I have been to, to Hungary a few times for language training, for language assessment. Um, what's interesting about Hungary um, is that you have a national requirement uh, to possess an upper intermediate language. That's at level B2. And um, this is at a national level, so it's not a it's not a like here in Germany, for example. It's not done by university by university. It's done at the national level. Um, it's a whole organization. You have to be certified. You have to submit your certification to the government. You have to be approved. Uh, it's all centrally um, administered, right? So uh, you're required to have at least a level B two or higher level um, from one language to be able to meet the university standards. So nowadays in Hungary, that means if you cannot demonstrate that you have at least a level B2 in one language, uh, you can't go to university. Or, um, you know, they, they have a point system there. So if you, have, if you have a C1, you actually get more points. It, it helps you out even more. Um, so here we are uh, with Hungary, where we have a situation that, um, it's a huge amount of testing done across the board in, in Hungary. And that means that uh, it's a high stakes test in this case, right? If you don't pass the test, you don't, um, you, you, you can't go to university. And that means for us uh, as, as TELC uh, that our tests really have to be reliable and valid, right? It's really important that we offer fair tests. The tests are good and that we don't, well, have any silly mistakes. Uh, it also means that the, the tests are comparable across the board, right? Uh, that one student in Hungary taking the test on one day has the same chance to be successful on the test as another student taking another test on a different day. In Hungary, I think it's interesting because up until now, uh, this, this new system started about two years ago. Um, and up until then, the system worked slightly different and uh, university students have been expected to submit their language certificates uh, at the end. So they couldn't get their degree until they demonstrated the language ability. So we had older students <clears throat> um, in Hungary for our language testing. Um, nowadays, they're, they're much younger um, and they really have to get the level at, at before they go to university, which, which also has an effect on our tests. Um, you know, the topics that we use, what we, what we uh, offer them in our tests. Good. Another example, of course, Germany, as I mentioned before, Germany has a decentralized system. That means every university can decide for themselves which language level that they, uh, they, they require. Uh, they belong to a collection of universities, so they try to make some uh, decisions uh, collectively uh, with each other. However, in Germany, the situation is that um, even though there's a, a collective decision, these are only recommendations. So each university really has the um, the freedom to choose their language level on their own. Uh, what that means, or, or, or the way it comes out, is that we have the um, we have the language, the universities requiring a higher level, right? Uh, university. Uh, of a C1, of course, in German to go to a German universities, but many require also a C1 in English as well to go to universities. 
Um, maybe some of you have some experience in Germany. You will know that many uh, German universities are now teaching in English as well. Um, and then we also have the universities, uh, what they call universities of applied sciences or the so-called Fachhochschule, uh, which have a more uh, vocational spin uh, on what they're doing. And those require a language level B2. Good. What's really interesting for us now at TELC uh, is another project um, that we're working on. And this is the uh, European Personnel Selection Office, the EPSO, people love their acronyms here. Um, and a very interesting project for us uh, and also for what we do at TELC. Um, in this case, the European Personnel Selection Office to uh, to be a civil servant in Europe, um, you have to demonstrate two languages. Your first language must, of course, be one of the twenty four official EU languages at level C one, um, and your second language must be different from language one, of course, and at level B two. Now, language one you can demonstrate because most likely it's going to be your mother tongue hopefully if not then you'll have to uh, take a test or you've studied in that language uh, you know having a university degree from um from a european school would also demonstrate language ability at c1 um well what's interesting for telc is that we are uh we're looking at language two at level b1 that these people for the european personnel selection office have to demonstrate. And so what we're doing at TELC now, at the moment, what we've been doing is testing 24 languages at level B2. So TELC really has a lot of experience at level B2, uh, testing all 24 of the languages that you see here um, at level B2. And I'm just wondering if I look, Tom, how many of these languages do you speak here anyway? Hmm? I think I could definitely get into an argument in at least 11 of those languages. I couldn't get out of the argument in more than about four. Um, which like is an argument, argument with a girlfriend or like on, on the street? I think I can get into arguments with girlfriends. I vaguely remember being young and single and having girlfriends. And um, <laughs> I seem to be able to get into an argument with anybody um, in, a, in any language. But in the street, I'm thinking, you know, I could probably... Um, offend somebody quite easily in my you know babyish um use of italian um mm -hmm. but i could offend somebody in greek and then continue to offend them <laughs> okay it's very easy to offend greeks though so that's maybe a cultural thing <laughs> be offensive in 24 different european languages <laughs> i'm afraid that's not part of the test but we could consider adding that uh you know <laughs> onto our b2 level test uh, what that gets to, though, I, I think is what's really wonderful to demonstrate with this and, and what to show is um, level B2, not just being for English, right, or the separate, not only being for English, but it's actually something we use across the board for languages. Uh, the the the, uh, the CEFR was developed to use to be used across Europe um, and creating all these tests in 24 different languages and making sure on top of it all that in each of these 24 languages, it's level B2, right? And that's the main thing that we have to think about. And I want to get into uh, the, the CEFR in the, in the next step of my talk here, uh, but really thinking about what's the expectation for CEFR? level B2. What are we doing and how can we compare it across languages? Uh, what we do, and, and when, I, when I say we, I mean the people listening to me and myself and Tom and Adrian and, and everybody else, is what we do is we want to make sure that we're developing an assessment at level B2, which is reliable. That means it's, it's you can trust the score. Um, and it's also comparable. So if I take a, a TELC test, at level B2, it has the same meaning as a, a TOEFL test or an IELTS test or, or any other test out there that we're all at the same level. And it's not only important for me as a language specialist to say, well, my level, yes, I, 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 you know, I, I'm pulling my weight. I do the same thing. I do a similar job. But it, it's super important for the test taker that the guy with a TELC B2 has the same value and has the same knowledge and has the same ability 
as uh, somebody else that has a B2 from somewhere else, right? And not that one student has a, um, an advantage over another student. No, really, it's, it's all about fairness. Good. So <laughs> what are we looking for at level B2? Uh, that's the level, the go-to level for us. And we're, um, yeah, we're using that as our base. But don't forget that we, we have a whole, a whole scale of uh, Sephir levels here, right? Well, first of all, my Sephir, I, I think for most of us, uh, when we're looking at the Sephir, we kind of think of these scales here, right? I just picked out a, a scale, overall reading comprehension, uh, and we see kind of uh, where we are. But I still think in, in my Sephir, the scale I use for whatever I'm doing, for what I'm teaching, uh, for my scale, it's important that I, I think about what it means to me and what I'm looking for. Here at level P, uh, B2, I see, I'm just fiddling around my screen, sorry, uh, can read with a degree of independence, right? Uh, adapting style and speed of reading. So we're talking about reading here, but I already see that we're talking about a degree of independence. We have a broad reading vocabulary. However, and we can't forget this, they talk about this in the Sefer all the time. I mean, we, we, there are also limitations. And we see here that a B2 person may experience some difficulty, which is totally fine. I think we can't forget that. I, I tell my students, well, you know, because they get frustrated, oh, I'm such a terrible English speaker. Uh, and I tell them, well, listen, if, if, if your English were perfect, you wouldn't be here with me, right? I mean, that's the whole idea of learning. And I think it's really important. When we look at these scales, I, I can point to the student that comes to me and that's very upset about their language ability, and I, we can go through the scales together. And I say, well, look, A1, that's no problem for you, right? And they'll agree. They'll say, yeah, of course, you want to say A2. And really, uh, you can prove to anybody with these scales, hey, here you are, you're at B2. Do you agree with that? Can you do this? And they'll look at it and they'll think about it and they'll say, well, actually I can, I'm, I must be a B2. And I'm not only a B2 because Sean McDonald says I'm a B2 and he's a nice guy, but really what does he know? But uh, there's a, a really fat book, an important book with important text in it that will tell me exactly, well, this is a B2. So before I go on, I would like you to look at this here. Which one is B2? So as you can see, I have four uh, Sefer scales, right? Four descriptors. Number one, two, three, and four. And I'd like you to take maybe two minutes to look at it and then write in the chat which number you think is B2, okay? I'll be quiet for a moment. Take a moment to read and write in the chat what do you think, which number is B2? Okay, I'm looking at the chat now, and uh, that's great. Everybody is taking part. That's really cool. And I see running through it that most of you uh, have made a choice. Before I, I say what the choice is, you can see in the chat, I guess, uh, I'd like to move on here. Um, and again, before I tell you the final answer, right? So I'm gonna go back. Uh, one, two, three, four, right? So this here, one, two, three, four. The bottom right is number four. Um, and we see I've also highlighted a few uh, words here that I think are important. Good command of idiomatic expressions, right? Fluent, effective, wide range. Uh, number three, the bottom left, can express himself, herself fluently, right? almost effortlessly. And the bottom right can communicate uh, with some confidence on familiar routine and non-routine matters related to his or her interest in professional field. So these are four scales. These are the four scales for uh, speaking. And again, if you look at the highlighted terms, does anybody want to change their answer? some confidence, good command of idiomatic expressions. That should be kind of a clue for you there. Fluently, accurately, effectively. 
All right. Then, um, here we are. I'll show you what I've got. This is taken from uh, the speaking scale on the Cipher, as I said before. And uh, if I go, the bottom right, number four, which many of you said is B1, actually. And if I go back, I'd like to point out why it's B1, because you're talking about some confidence. Uh, they can express thoughts on more abstract cultural topics, such as film, books, music, um, and uh, deal with less routine situations. But it's not really all the way. So that's B1. Level B2 was box number two. So if you... Uh, chose box number two, you can give yourself a pat on the back, right? Uh, you're talking about fluency accurately and effectively on a wide range. And I think it was really important for you as, or for us as teachers here, uh, on a wide range of general academic, vocational or leisure topics. And we're also talking about communicating spontaneously with good grammatical control without much sign of having to restrict what he or she wants to say and adopt a level of formality. And I really like this, this is why I chose this one. I think it really describes very accurately what we are looking for from a B2 level student um, in our schools. The other ones, if you look here, uh, you can see, well, a good command of idiomatic expressions and colloquialisms, that's usually a tip off right away. Uh, I'll show you. So uh, fluently and spontaneously, almost effortlessly is our C1. Um, good command. And there's little obvious searching for expressions. So that gets us to level C1. And uh, as I said before, a good command of idiomatic expressions and colloquialisms, of course, is our C2. That's where it gets tricky, uh, getting it into idiomatic language, colloquial language. Um, and you hear, that's, that's when you know, when you talk to somebody um, and, and, and they're, they're going along um, and somebody that's a, a learner of English and they start using colloquialism and idiomatic language, that's where you know that, okay, they've, they've got it. They know what they're, they're doing. All right. I'm just gonna check the chat again and make sure I didn't miss any questions. Just one moment, sorry. So the answer is number two, yes. The answer is number two. And uh, somebody wrote a skull, <laughs> ha ha. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, then what we wanna do then um, with our uh, Sefer scales is uh, mapping our, our information, the things that we have onto the Cepher, um, and where we can create an item or we can, we can look at our, our documentation or what we have and compare them to the scales to the Cepher and see uh, how that adds up to what we're doing, right? And how it, it fits with what our expectations are in the Cepher. Um, for example, here reading, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, reading for information and argument, um, looking at the sales, looking for certain information and uh, matching that to a text. And so this can go either way. I mean, here's a, a bit of text uh, that we found that would match to the Sefer. Um, we can go either way. We can take a, a bit of text and, and see how it matches to the Sefer or we can take a look at the Sefer and we can find uh, uh, some text that will go along with it. Good. I'd like to skip ahead. I think I've been talking a bit too long, but that's okay. Um, well, that's never true. Um, but in this case, sort of yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? No, no. The it's not too long. It's just we're uh, we're we're on a strict timing. So um, we're uh, we're just hoping to finish up relatively soon, if that's all right. Okay. Which good. is a shame because I could listen to you forever. 
<laughs> then I'll finish up. Uh, two things I'd like to, to uh, point out before I go is a, a correlation between re receptive and productive skills. Uh, where we want to look at four skills, speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Um, and many people hope for a correlation that looks like the scale that you have in front of you, when indeed uh, the correlation is much weaker and it looks like this here. So uh, we really do have to test all four skills um, to, to really see how people do in each skill. And there, there is a weak correlation, as you can see here, there, there is some correlation, uh, but it's a, a rather weak correlation. And I think uh, I'll make my, my PowerPoint available for you. Um, and I, I have some information on teaching the four skills here. Um, and I think I'll wrap up. Tom's getting nervous. Um, his talk will be much better than mine. Um, and, and wake you up. <laughs> and I so I think- at all. I can't back that up. <laughs> <laughs> You're much more entertaining. You're much cleverer. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. I'll be around afterwards if you have any questions um, and I'll make my PowerPoint available for you. Thank you very much and have a good day. Enjoy the rest of the session. All right. Thank you, Sean. And our second presenter uh, is Dr. Jenny Wong. She's an associate professor in the Department of English and Wenzhou. And she's going to talk about experiences and challenges of using EMI in higher education, a case in Wenzhou. Let's welcome Dr. Jenny Wong. Hi, thank you, Tony. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. And uh, the moment I'll try to share my PowerPoint, I got a problem. Um, sharing my PowerPoint the moment. Uh, somebody- uh, Sean, Sean, you might want to stop sharing. Yeah, so I can share. Sean? Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, clicking the button. Yes, yes, yes. So now I can share mine. Okay, sorry. Let me do this. I have to find my PowerPoint first. Okay. Can you see my PowerPoint? No. Um, Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Me either. I have to... F um, I got a problem sharing the PowerPoint. Uh, so... Jenna, you need to open your PPT file first, and right. then you have the share screen. Yeah, it will be there. I will open it already, but it's not showing. I don't know why. Uh, so, oh, okay, here we are. Okay. So I hope that everybody can hear, uh, can see my PowerPoint now? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, okay my name is Janet. I'm from Wenzhou Ursula University of Languages. And today I'm going to talk about the experience and challenges using EMI in higher education, the case uh, in Wenzhou. Okay, and this is my table of contents. Uh, I'm going to start with the background of the study and then give a definition of uh, EMI. And I would like to talk about the different opinions about EMI in Taiwan, especially focus on Wenzhou's experience. Then I would like to propose a framework of the EMI teacher's development model and then conclude with initiatives and conclusion. Okay, now we start with why we're getting all here. Okay, many teachers. Okay, we're here because that in 2018, the National Development Council um, proposed the blueprint blueprint for developing Taiwan into bilingual nation by 2030. And the two visions, one is uh, cultivating people's interproficiency, of course. The second is that they hope that to elevate national competitiveness. So because of that, the Ministry of Education in Taiwan uh, proposed to implement two plans. One is about uh, K-12 level teachers to teach, number one, teaching English in English, 
Number two, using CLIO, which is content and language integrated learning, and also uh, try to implement ESP. And for the higher education, um, they hope that we can use, um, transform more the courses into EMI courses and use B2, what um, Sean just talked about in the uh, CEFR. So what is the EMI? Um, according to the definition here is um, the use of uh, lang English language to teach academic subjects in countries or uh, jurisdiction where the first language of the majority of population is not English. So the point here is here. Number one, that you have to use English. Okay. Number two, the subject you teach is other than English itself. It means that it's, it's a more content subject. Number three, the majority of the students, their first language is not English. So the point is here, EMI, uh, the learning outcome usually tied more directly to the content rather than the language. Okay. So, but I prefer to look at um, the EMI from another perspective, what we call a continuum of EMI. When we say continuum, means that it's like a spectrum, like a line. So on the left-hand side, you can see it more, focuses more on the content. On the right-hand side, it focuses more on the language. Um, so I would was, I was think this is a better uh, interpretation of an EMI. It de actually depends on the context and on, depends on the teachers and also the subject as well as the students. So what do some of the teachers opinion about EMI? Now let's look at content teachers. There are three top concerns for content teachers. Number one is if they use EMI, they're concerned whether they will reduce the learning uh, effects. Okay, number two, teachers worry about whether they will double, it will double their workload, of course, as teachers. Number three, uh, it will compromise the course materials. Okay. In addition to that, teacher also, um, you know, worry about the proficiency. Nobody is the teachers, their own proficiency or the students' English proficiency. Okay. Some uh, many of the content teachers they will ask the question: Do they need to teach language when they teach the content? And the fact is, very little language teaching in most of the EMI courses by the content teachers because they don't think it's their responsibility. How about for language teachers' opinion? Okay, for language teachers, um, many of them actually think that um, th there's not enough ESP teaching materials. Okay? In other words, not many textbooks. Okay? And also, mm, many of them think that they don't have enough professional knowledge, okay? Uh, also worry about students' English proficiency, okay? And they're not sure what do the student really want, okay? Whether they want to learn more language or they want to put more focus on the content. And they don't have, another issue is they don't have time to prepare the um, teaching material. So how about students? Uh, many of the local students who participate in the EMI courses, they actually hope to enhance their English through EMI courses. This is really interesting point because when we just review that from the literature that many of the EMI content teachers, they don't think that they should teach English. Uh, the second is uh, some of the local students, they wondering why when I learn in the content that I have to learn through English. So why English? Okay. Number three is so they worry about uh, whether they can acquire the content knowledge as much as they learned with their mother tongue. So what is the challenge for the schools? I think the biggest challenge is where they can find teachers who are willing and able to teach EMI courses. I think this is actually um, bother um, for many of the administrators. So now I'm going to move on to, to my second topic, which is uh, Wenzhou. Okay, uh, I would like to give a very simple background of Wenzhou Ursula University of Languages. Uh, we are at the moment still the only university of languages in Taiwan. And um, 
we are also the first school that implement English as an instructional medium since it's established 50 years ago. So uh, all students, they have to take English, they have to take 24 English credits, either in EAP or ESP or EMI courses. Okay, and then before they graduate, they have to, they have to pass this uh, English proficiency test as a graduation benchmark. Okay, so also in 2021, uh, with the subsidies of the Ministry of Education, Wenzhou, uh, established a training base to provide this uh, EI training programs for teachers in Taiwan university and colleges. So based on this background, um, first of all, I will talk about what the policy that the uh, school uh, provides so that to provide an environment that, so that the teachers can follow. Number one is um, since academic year 104, okay, once I started to give awards to the EMI content teachers, okay, the content teachers who are willing to transfer them, their, their course into an EMI courses. Uh, uh, starting from this year, 2021, uh, the school gave guidelines for bilingual language integrating into curriculum design and instruction, which means that they give some guidelines to teachers to follow um, in terms of top language talk courses or AMI courses, uh, either it's face to face or online, and also how to do this bilingual teaching material and how to design the curriculum. Okay, so policy is very important. So they give uh, uh, teachers a guideline. Uh, the second thing that the school do is uh, provide teacher teacher training, okay? There are two kinds of training. Number one is um, EMI skills workshop that we cooperate with the English Council to provide a five-day workshop, okay? Focus on hands-on training and also the micro-teaching. Another kind of training that we provide to teachers is this online EMI skill courses provide, uh, we collaborate with uh, Cambridge Assessment English. Uh, this training course, online training courses last for 16 weeks, including eight modules. Okay, the content including like uh, how to improve the frequency uh, use of uh, academic lectures, accuracy of uh, expression, how to use your body language, how to lecture for large groups or seminar versus one on one consultation, and how to do the online teaching, so on and so forth. Okay, because this is online course, so it's more flexible. And, and the teachers can adjust their own pace and some more structure, so more teachers actually participate to do it. But the drawback is because it's online, so uh, there is a, a lack of interaction and there's no hands-on like the micro teaching. Um, so in order to complement that, the school used two tools to help teachers, you know, Number one is uh, they establish an online teachers community so we can talk to, with each other. Another is uh, we have this weekly reminder from the administrator to remind us you have to get on the online courses. So the outcome, this is the outcome after all the policy and also the supports from the school. At the moment, when uh, uh, there are 75 teachers already got the certificates uh, of what I just mentioned, uh, the on, no matter is the workshop or is online teaching. And 58 of those teachers are from English related departments and 42 actually from non-English departments. They actually cover uh, a different, you can see cover different majors. But still there are uh, some concern from the trader. Number one is they found it's still very difficult, even when it's very difficult to invite teachers to join the EMI training. Uh, one of the main issue is time conflicts. The teachers, most of them very busy and teacher also concerned about this, what we call micro teaching. And you have to understand that the, uh, that the teachers, uh, some of the teachers in tertiary level they are actually, we call the isolated profession. We actually care about uh, the individuality and, and uh, the, you know, uh, some of the issues here. So, um, so yeah, in my courses in one side at the moment, I want to show you this chart. The, the, you can see the gray bar is uh, the courses 
the number of courses offered by non-English departments, and the blue bar is the course number of courses offered by the English related departments. Okay, there's not much difference in the English related departments offered courses, but for the non-English department courses, there is a uh, actually a quite good increase from 42 courses up to 134 courses in academic year 109. So it's more like three times difference. So this is uh, some of the new EMI course or ESP courses offered in 2021, okay, by uh, most of courses like ESP courses or EMI courses. And the, this, this is another uh, kind of courses which is a new model, what we call the future work lab. It's a, it's a one credit EMI courses uh, tailored for those students who want to do this autonomous learning. Because most of them are uh, business related. Uh, now I want to, talk, want to discuss uh, other EMI teacher development programs in Taiwan offered by the Ministry of Education since 2010. Uh, they sponsored the Regional Education Resource Center to offer this uh, EMI teacher uh, development programs. I listed four here. You can see that three of them actually overseas and only one based in Taiwan. So this is what Choi um, suggested in his uh, uh, framework for the teacher development program. And he proposed that there should be three parts. One is English language training. Second is pedag pedagogical training. The third is uh, licensing certification. In the English train, English language training, um, is the courses should include number one, of course, re more related to language, such as uh, uh, classroom instruction language or how to have uh, more interactive skills and uh, um, improve the accent and have the concept of word Englishes. The second is the pedagogical training. Uh, it's not enough only to have good English proficiency that the teachers who you know qualify to be a EMI teachers they have to know how to teach. Okay, so such as uh, how to improve the English profit, uh, presentation skills and how to uh, plan the lessons, how to deliver it, how to manage the, court, the, the class and how to do this ta task space, have more activities, more interactive, active, uh, interactive uh, activities, and how to do collaborative or cooperative learning, how to case studies teaching, how to handle the small or large courses, so on and so forth. And this, the third part is about licensing uh, certification. Uh, one is that they propose that um, the language trainer and the content experts uh, should both be invited to evaluate the participants. And the second that is very also good is um, to form alliance with other Asian countries to invite the language experts and also content experts from different cultures. And the third is um, the language training program should offer to the EMI teachers before they receive these certificates. And also remind the uh, Chui also reminds us that uh, the short-term intensive language program would not be the best option. So based on all this, how should we uh, move forward? Okay, I think one of the important thing is um, how we can equip our teachers uh, with dual ability, okay, uh, with co course content and English communication, and also a very positive attitude on EMI. So this is number one, as teachers, I think uh, we have to understand why uh, we have to implement in EMI in higher education. What is the goal? You have to link the school goals with the teacher's career. Number two is who you should invite, can be the pioneer teachers, and how to support them, and uh, also, uh, what what should be included in this EMI training? Uh, where should be where should this workshop be held? Is on campus, overseas, online, or blended? And how long it will be? 
So these are some of the initiatives I want to propose. Number one is I think the institution should set a very clear goal, step-by-step -step objective, and also suitable strategies to provide the and to convince teachers like us in you know, my teachers, okay, so that we have to, to adopt the CMI. So we have to understand, in other words, that you have to give teachers the rationale and the goals. And this, this, another thing I also think important is the school have to establish a school level. Okay, I emphasize on the school level, the treated office that can coordinate these different resources. Second is, um, I think the institutions should foster a learning environment and provide incentive okay, and continue support to the teachers. Okay. Uh, this kind of uh, learning environment will encourage teachers to continue learning. Also, um, they will, you know, when they do this, they got the rewards, they got, they got recognition, and they got encouragement. And the uh, support has to be systematic one and continuous one. Okay. Also, the uh, institutions should have more realistic goals rather than, you know, uh, impractical one. Another is about collaboration and dissemination. Uh, I think the mentor program is a good option. We can encourage the experienced teachers and novice teachers to work together and or we can encourage uh, different academic disciplines, teachers like content teachers and language teachers to work together. Okay, and also we can encourage teachers to establish the community so they can share knowledge and um, skills. Number four is uh, teachers and materials and resources and tools. Since that many teachers actually worry about this and no teaching materials, one of the thing is uh, lacking the specific corpus database. So. We, we should establish this uh, specific corpus for specific professional discipline. And also like uh, we can establish wiki, space, uh, space, wiki, wiki pages and um, have some terminology for different fields, uh, provide a different functionality, uh, function language used in different fields. Uh, for teachers in tertiary levels, TA can be provided. The last one is the EMI teaching quality assurance, which is means that what kind of uh, quality that should be uh, evaluated uh, for teachers who are using uh, EMI. So this is my conclusion. Number one, I think that EMI up to now, until now is not yet a full-fledged practice in higher education in Taiwan. Okay. So it's very important that we have to distinguish what is the realistic and or idealist goal for uh, teachers in EMI development training. Number three is uh, the short-term workshop or short-term training session actually is not enough, not enough. So we have to provide this a continuous uh, professional development training for teachers. Number four is uh, communication and active skills are essential to excess of the EMI classes, which means that um, only have a good language proficiency is not enough. Teachers have to learn the pedagogy skills rather than just the speaking perfect English. Okay. Another thing is collaboration. I would like to encourage collaboration between the content teacher and language teacher. Or we can incorporate this ESP course in the curriculum to close the gap between the EAP course and the EMI courses. The last one is when implement the EMI in Taiwan's context. I think we should have a con a Taiwan model, which is which I want to suggest is uh, the different degree of EMI in the spectrum uh, can better scale for our both our teachers and our students of different linguistic ability. Okay, and this is the the end of my talk, and uh, um, probably we can talk more at in the QA session. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Janet. Yes. Uh, and our next presenter is Tom Jones, uh, the gentleman who has been leading a lot of good discussions in the chat box with many uh, participants earlier. Uh, he is the Director of Business Development at Atlantic College in Ireland. And the topic of his talk today is 
challenges and difficulties with EMI and best practice from European countries. Let's welcome Tom. Hello, welcome. For some reason, I'm not able to start my video, uh, but you have got my voice, which I think is important. Um, the uh, there we go. Yeah, no, you can't actually see my video, which ruins the first thing I was going to do, which was going to be really good. But never mind, it doesn't matter. I shall do That's it. That's probably better for us all anyway. It's probably better for everybody. Frankly, um, I'm not a very attractive person. So not seeing me is, I think, a great advantage. For it really many adds to the talk, yeah. <laughs> it does, it does. Uh, I'm much better by radio. If you want to know what I look like, um, just picture um, a young Robert Redford um, with, you know, I mean, obviously, slightly darker hair. But other than that, exactly the same as me. Um, what I wanted to do today is just talk a little bit there because what I'm able to do, which is great, is follow um, Dr. McDonald and Dr. Wen, which obviously means that what I can do is say the things they've said because they are both very clever. So now I can say those things and sound clever myself, which let me just tell you, my top tip when speaking in a webinar or at a conference is to speak after very intelligent people because it makes you look clever. Um, when we were practicing this and uh, myself and Sean and um, myself and Sean were going through what we were talking about and then we'd done a practice and um, Dr. Wen also joined in and I was really pleased because actually a lot of her stuff is the, the kind of putting a seal on what I was thinking myself to talk about the challenges. Uh, that we're facing. So I'm very pleased and very grateful to her for having basically stood up as a very clever person and said the things that I was going to say, because it really makes sense. Um, I'd also, I'm really sorry to disappoint you. Um, I can't sing. Somebody in the chat is actually uh, asking me if I can. Uh, I can't sing at all. I'm a really bad singer. Um, I have the name, but that's unfortunately it. So uh, I'm not able to, uh, to sing, which is probably best. Um, Oh, and sorry, who's in Turkey? Yun Chang Yun is in Turkey. Oh, I'm also in Turkey. There we are, there's an amazing fact for you. Um, okay, ladies and gents, if I can take you back in time, this is a million years ago and the world is young, right? And all we're doing is we're thinking about when I was 16 years old, ladies and gents. So when I was 16 years old, I had a job. I worked in school, of course, but um, I had a job in the evenings and the weekends. And my job was actually um, working in Burger King. Uh, Penny, hello in Istanbul. Sorry, just no, slight distraction there. Um, John, I, I, I hate to interrupt you. Uh, do you share the PowerPoint slide with us? Uh, no. Okay. So I haven't got a PowerPoint slide, but I have got a voice. Um, I don't have uh, a PowerPoint slide because I was hoping to be able to actually see you through the camera, but that appears to be disabled. So you've got a black screen, but just, you know, just relax. Just, you know, have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee. Uh, think, because I'm taking you back in time. So if you can just imagine I'm 16 years old. And then, oh, hang on. Magic, look, there we are, that's me. All right, when I said that I looked like a young Robert Redford, that was a lie. I don't look like a young Robert Redford, and I'm sorry. But anyway, look, this is what we've got, so uh, let's do what we can. Now, um, what I'd like to do, ladies and gents, is take you back in time. So have a think about, uh, <laughs> busted indeed. Um, the, great to see you, thank you, Grace, that's very generous. Um, tragically, I, I do look like um, Father Christmas on holiday. Um, I am currently in Turkey, which obviously it feels uh, more handsome than Robert Redford. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, that woman. Um, or man, anyone, doesn't matter. Uh, very happy to be seen as handsome. Um, I do look like Gandalf's uh, less reputable brother rather than Robert Redford, which is uh, a shame. But there, a great voice. There we are. Thank you. Well, that's lucky. Um, now, ladies and gents, I'm going to introduce you today to two people. One of those people is Sam Dravida, who is former president of Ayatefel Slovenia, 
um, very active in the region um, and is going to talk to us about a lot of intelligence things. But the other person I want to introduce you to is this person here. And this person here, ladies and gents, is called Publius Varus. And Publius Varus is, in fact, as you can tell, a Roman. Now, you may say to me, but Tom, why do you want to introduce us to a Roman who occasionally looks like your, your screen? Um, the reason I want to introduce you to him is because 2,000 years ago, ladies and gents, when the Romans ruled much of Europe and North Africa, people spoke Latin. Now, people had to speak Latin because if you were going to survive in Roman culture and civilization, you had to speak the language. And that's kind of true now because we all have to learn English to some degree. Now, I mean, he is a toy soldier. Oh, thank you. Um, Publius Varus here may have been an Italian. They weren't Italian then, obviously, but he might have been a Roman from what is now Italy. And he might have spoken Latin as a mother tongue. But it's equally possible that he might have been a Greek or he might have been a Babylonian or he might have been from virtually anywhere in the Roman Empire. But he would have spoken Latin day to day. And he might have spoken great Latin. And he might have spoken a wonderful academic level of Latin. But he might not. So if he was, for example, a lowly soldier, just standing in the ranks and stopping people killing him, then maybe he didn't speak very good Latin at all. And with the other people in his cohort, in his platoon, he might have spoken his first language, which may have been Assyrian. It may have been anything other than Latin, but he would have understood basic orders. If he'd have been an optio and a slightly kind of superior soldier, what we call a sergeant or a corporal today, he might have spoken more Latin. And if he'd have wanted to one day become a centurion, the very highest of high, he would have had to speak a far higher level of Latin and he would have had to read and write in Latin. Now, there was no CEFR scale 2000 years ago, um, but there would have been similar levels of assessment or similar levels of knowledge. And that's kind of the point I wanted to look at today in terms of how EMI can affect us. And if we're thinking of the Romans, what's interesting now, 2000 years later, nobody speaks Latin. Uh, there was recently an advert for a Latin teacher um, at a school in the UK, which was quite uh, you know, shared on the internet because they said, must be a native speaker. And of course, nobody is a native speaker of Latin anymore. Um, so, you know, what's fascinating is thinking that 2000 years ago, everybody within that sphere of the world had to speak Latin. And now nobody speaks Latin. So we are currently in a stage of, of um, our species where we have to largely speak or understand some English or at least some version of English. And whether that will continue to be true and for how long, who knows? But if I can take you back, ladies and gents, I'm 16 years old. I have hair, a full head of hair. Gosh, it's glorious. And then I had a job, right? I'm working at school, I'm doing my schoolwork. To be honest, not very much of that. I've had five years of French, five years of sitting in French classes. I can, at best, say, you know, bonjour, ça va, comment allez-vous? Very basic French, right? In British culture at the time, the way that we taught languages was already doomed because the first class we learned to say, je ne comprends pas, I don't understand. In the second class, we learned to say, parlez-vous anglais, do you speak English? You know, already so <laughs> admitting defeat and desperately hoping that the other person would speak our own language. Um, so five years of French, I'm 16 and I'm working at the weekends and the evenings. Now, look at me now, ladies and gents, as you now can with the camera. I'm wearing a shiny watch, shiny, shiny watch. I'm also wearing glasses, key signs of an academic, right? key signs of an intellectual, ladies and gents. I've got a beard, which means I can go like this. Key signs of an intellectual. But 16 
at 16, none of that was true. No shiny watch, ladies and gentlemen, no glasses, hair. At 16, I worked in Burger King. Now, I don't know if that translates culturally, right? But at 16, in my culture, working in Burger King is failure. It's the lowest of the low. But worse, one day after about a year of working in Burger King, I get sacked. And now, obviously, as an adult, I'm quite proud of that because it was very difficult to get sacked from Burger King. Anyway, I won't bore you with the details, but it's a great story. But I get sacked from Burger King, right? Um, this hair has fallen down my face. And it's currently here. Uh, it was all up here. It's all gone down here. My head looks like a pineapple. Anyway, I'm working in Burger King. I get sacked from Burger King. I'm walking home. I'm terrified because I have to say to my mother and father, I've been sacked. And then I have to tell them why. It's not going to be a great conversation. On my way home, I pass a very, very chic, very chic French restaurant in Britain, right? In Bristol at the time. And I think it's a restaurant. They need a waiter, maybe. And I go in and I'm greeted by two very, very, very chic French gentlemen, right? Lucien. And Serge, and they're incredibly chic, they're wonderful suits, they're just amazing. And I say to them, do you need a waiter? And they look at me, and they look at each other, and then they say, do you have experience? And I say, yes, I've worked in Burger King. And they both go and look genuinely horrified. Now, my point here, ladies and gents, is that it was a French restaurant. I'd learned French for five years. I went into there, and everybody spoke French. They gave me a job because they desperately needed some sort of some sort of idea of a waiter, and that was me. Anyway, my point is, I worked there for six months. Everybody spoke French the entire time. I understood nothing. People shouted at me a lot because I was a rubbish waiter and because I spoke no French. After six months, amazing Harry Potter moment, blah, suddenly I learned French and I could speak French, which in a sense is EMI because French in the classroom, I learned nothing at all. But in a classroom that was in French, that was not about French, I suddenly learned French. So I had a magic moment where people were shouting at me and going, you know, and suddenly I could shout back and it was great. Um, now, EMI, ladies and gents, is a key point, isn't it? Because when we're talking about EMI, we're talking, as Janet so, so competently said before, we're talking about content. So EMI is not about language, it's about content. And what she did there, I think, which was really good, was share that idea. We've got the EMI scale going right across, and then you've got the kind of CLIL in the middle, and then you've got ESL at one side. So what Alexis mentioned in the chat there was they, the point that if you're doing EMI, that's great, because it's content, and that's, that's fine, and that's really important. If you're doing a degree in physics, you need physics. Do you need it in English? You might also need it in English. And universities and countries are wanting to internationalize their universities, internationalize their programs, which is why EMI is what we're happening, what's, what's happening to us. And the reason for that, ladies and gents, is obviously just to give us all work. You know, we want internationalized universities. We want internationalized students. We're teaching our students the basic skills they're gonna need. And those are survival skills. And I think it's really interesting to see English as a survival tool and think again of this little Roman fella and the fact that that level of language, what level of language is going to be key? EMI without ESL is a really difficult thing to ask people to do because studying at a high level in you know, chemistry, physics, whatever it is, and not having the language skills or at least needing support and backup with language skills is really tough. So, you know, Jeff made a great
I think there's some problem with uh, the internet connection of Tom's end. Um, okay, and um, not sure if he can count spats uh, in a tiny manner. So, um, so maybe maybe it's best if I hello. I was supposed to talk while during his time of talking. Oh yeah. So um, maybe while Tom is trying to get back, I'll uh, introduce myself. Uh, I live and teach in a multilingual environment in Slovenia, uh, very close to Hungarian border, meaning that um, because of the mix of culture, uh, we have bilingual education for everyone, uh, mandatory in Slovenian and English, and uh, Hungarian, sorry, but I teach English. And somebody already said that um, we need to um, have students who like and want to learn the language, the second language. And I think that is the key thing. Uh, I'm assuming that what you are trying to do in your bilingual uh, education is Taiwanese or I don't know, and English. But what I can see in, um, in my uh, surrounding here is, for example, Slovenian is the basic language one, and then you have Hungarian language two. And a lot of people for, uh, for historical um, and other reasons do not value Hungarian as a language that you're supposed to know. And therefore what happens, even though they have bilingual education for 13, 14 years, meaning that all their lessons in all subjects are carried out in both languages, at least partially, they still can't speak Hungarian. And uh, when they come to me in secondary school and I teach them English, you see that it's not a problem that they are stupid or that they can't, they are not good with languages because their English is great. So the question is, what is the difference between learning Hungarian and ha having it all the way throughout schooling and in the environment, like all signs are bilingual and then English. And the difference is the key thing is that English is uh, cool. English is the language that they want to learn because of, not because of school or I think young people rarely have this idea of, I need to learn English to be better professionally later, but very basic, I need to learn English because I want to watch Netflix. And uh, there is no subtitles in Slovenian on Netflix or there has never been dubbing in Slovenian. So a lot of um, students, if they want to play games online, if they want to watch Netflix with kind of cooler uh, films, then they want to learn English. And I have observed in my practice, a lot of people whose English was fantastic, like B2 level by the time they are 14. And even though later I say, wow, I'm such a good teacher, I also know deep down that it's more due to the fact that English is cool. Yes. Mm. So I think somebody earlier already said that you need to kind of persuade them that English is cool and you know um, that this is worth learning. I think even though we know that it will be better for them professionally later, that is not 
an incentive for a teenager, for example. I work with um, 16 to 19 year olds and um, it's just not, not on their agenda yet. It will be possibly later. Uh, and there was another thing that I wanted um, to say. Oh yeah, um, I haven't heard anyone, and you were thinking about how can we get the teachers who would be able to teach one subject in one and the other language. What we have done here, at least for the uh, earlier classes for uh, grades one, two, and three of primary school is uh, they have now for, I think, some 15 years, this has been working now, they've introduced two teachers because research shows that uh, language is very directly tied to a person. So when you, when you know a person like, and you start talking to them in one language, think, think about people you know very well. Even though you know that these people can speak English, um it is e easier for you to talk to them in your mother tongue because that's how you are used to it's 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 what you are used to with that person so what they've started now in schools is you get two teachers and um, one teacher is for language one the other teacher is for language two um and um yeah uh, so for example, my um, both teachers know both languages. Of course, it will never be on the same level. You will always, it, we are human beings, we will always know one language better than the other. Uh, but once they start teaching, they select, they would be teaching in one language. So the students know them by like this teacher, this language. For example, when I had my uh, daughter in primary school in year three, so after three years and in one moment, she heard me talk to the teacher in language one. And that was the teacher she, she, she was used to in language two. And she was very obviously surprised. She didn't even know that teacher could speak that language. Of course, language two would be easier for her, but it never even came up. And that's how she learned language too fantastically. So if, if you're talking about content and language together, I think there is this one thing that you need to um, have in mind that if your students are used to talking to you in one language, that's how they will, it will be very hard for them to use another language and still kind of keep it, um, yeah, that uh, keep it still normal. Like this, a normal situation, um, like social situation is if you have a group of people who all but one person speak two languages, just one person speaks one language, what happens is I don't know if there are people in Taiwan who are English, you will know uh, for the first five minutes, 10 minutes, people will be very polite and will all speak among themselves as well in the language that this one person who can only speak one language understands. But after a while, when kind of, if you get to a heated debate or if you kind of relax a bit, people will start moving back to the language they are used to with people they are used to talk. Yeah. Uh, two teachers for, all, well, ha, uh, maybe not for all subjects, but at least in the beginning, like in the first years, when, uh, when it's important for students, as you said, there is the content, but there is also the language part. And before students get to the level uh, where they can follow anything in language too, you will probably need that. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, 
and also it has to make sense definitely yeah co-teaching yes because um even for example i teach monolingual classes so i'm, I'm i say that monolingual meaning i speak the same language as my students but i teach them english so it's it's always it's always a question when they approach me it's much easier for both of us to do things in slovenian and we both know it so it's always a question of do we bother to do it in english and sometimes when we are in a hurry we just don't what subject do i teach? i teach english as a foreign language so mm, i'm an english teacher in a bilingual school which is slovenian and hungarian bilingual so english is a foreign language yeah so uh, i'm just trying to check what if there is another question or something that you would like to know okay yeah same case in taiwan that's that's what i thought yeah two teachers teach inter yeah twine so they are both in first three classes of primary school so when students are six seven eight years old there are two teachers in the classrooms which means that um those who come with language one will listen to one teacher more but also interact with the other teacher so that they by the time they are nine years old they can then kind of follow both and the teachers who come with language two, they will follow the other teacher more, but also learn kind of you mix them all up. Yeah. So that's from me. I'm not sure if uh, Tom is back. I wonder. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. But yes, making things uncool is really bad for language learning. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Jen, uh, for taking over Tom's session. Your quick response is highly appreciated. And hope Tom can manage to come back later. Um, and our last section titled as Experience Sharing with the Dynamic Placement Test will be presented by Dr. Antonia Sh uh, Shouzhen Ling. She is an associate professor and the director of the Center for English language teaching and Wenzhou. Let's welcome Dr. Lin. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, here's the session for my experience sharing junior college students' performances and perceptions of DPT. So actually, I'm uh, an English teacher in Department of English, and I'm also the chairperson of Center for English Language Teaching at Windsor. Before we start, let's have the definition first about the keywords DPT. Now have uh, 30 seconds, read this passage silently. So as you can see, the nine words are the key words which will be introduced in my talk. So let's have a game first. Can you find nine words in a puzzle? And the first one has been done for you. What you are going to do is to count if you can get the other eight words together. Again, 30 seconds for you. It could be upside down, cross, or backward. All right. Now let's see uh, how many words you can get here. Here's the answer for you. I hope you can get all the nine words here. Okay, unscramble, 30. Okay, adaptive, grammar, 
drag. Okay, and here reading, listening, and placement test. So after this definition, here's my outline for today's work. The background information, the preparation and implementation, and my study on DPT since 2019, conclusion and suggestions. I'd like to take this opportunity to appreciate Clarity, uh, Clarity English for the uh, sponsorship of my study. Now, in 2019, it is Clarity English from Hong Kong holding a meeting, inviting teachers to join this kind of conference. Our chairperson, actually the principal, Dr. Chen Neihua, Margaret Chen, along with the other two teachers, under the uh, introduction of Kima Huang from Clarity English uh, self, salesperson or wholesaler in Taiwan. And then they had the discussion, the experience doing DPT and uh, had the discussion about what it is about. And because of this event, we were assigned to have DPT on campus at Wenzhou. So preparation and implementation, it is the institutionalized. So teachers have to have the trial first with the guidelines. And the meeting in Hong Kong was in May. Here in July, we tried this uh, first initiative work. After that, we have the orientation for teachers and the TAs in September so that we can have the formal DPT test on campus. The time, so far we have done two DPT tests in the very beginning of the semester, that is September and uh, the other September in two, uh, 2019 and 2020. The participants and locations, that is for the freshmen in four-year college and five-year junior college. Altogether, 40 classes. For the four-year college students, they took the, uh, they took the test in the classroom. Only if they had the problem or failure about their smartphone, they would be guided to the lab. As to the five-year junior college freshmen, they did the DPT test in the lab as part of their regular classes. The length of DPT is 30 minutes also, plus the instruction time, which is about 10 to 15 minutes. In Wenzhou, doing this kind of DPT test is free. That means Wenzhou paid for it. And after the test, we got the results and the evaluation. As to the second part, that is the class-based, that is my study for my junior college freshman, one class, okay. Why did I say my study? Because I would like to know the pre-test and the post-test of the student's performance in DPT. And because of the general sponsorship from Clarity English, I was able to do the pre-test and post-test for my classes the first time in 20. 19 and 2020, and the second time in 2020 to 2021. Okay. Now, for DPT, if you don't know it, or if you haven't heard of it, it is a short introduction as we did in the definition game. It is an adaptive online test, whatever devices that you have can be done. It is actually about language elements, listening and reading. And the way of doing the answers or the questions are to drag with your mouse, unscramble to do the order of the conversation content or multiple choice. Okay, you can choose from the uh, list of four or three options, etc. The full mark is 120 and it takes about 30 minutes or so. In general, it is 30 minutes, but sometimes it might be a little bit longer because the system would like to know uh, what level the student will be ranked and therefore they will be asked to do some kind of bonus questions. 
In addition, we can also get the instant feedback with a CFR level result. That is a graph with the triangle. Inside the triangle, you can see the tendency of your strengths and weaknesses. And the last one, well, it is eco-friendly, less, uh, less marking and less paper consumption. So it is a new trend for language proficiency test. But actually, this one is to place students in different levels. So we call that the dynamic placement test. Now, in this table, you can see the students pre-test, post-test in the first year and the second year projects. It seems that the freshmen in the five-year junior college that is about 15 years old, okay, uh, basically the number falls in B1 for the freshmen. Okay. However, we can also see that we do have higher level students in the very beginning, but then the increase could be found. And similarly, in the second year project, it is uh, the same. Okay. Now, here I will show you the DPT and CSEP performances of over the two years that my students did. Now in Wenzhou, uh, we not only provide DPT free, but also CSEP free. And you can see the students, my class, okay, students work and their performances in CSEP, the orange one. Okay. And then the DPT part. Now you might wonder how come this one is zero? Well, you can get that. It's because of the COVID-19 in 2020 and CSEP was canceled. So if I did the correlation of CSEP and DPT scores that my students did, well, that is positively uh, correlated, as you can see the number here. Okay. And I also did the pair sample t-test of DPT scores for these two pairs of the students. Well, in the first year, the results show that the uh, significance of the pre-test and post-test. However, in the second year, there was no significance. Now, in the end of the academic year, I made a survey for students. And then in the survey, there were 14 questions based on the instructors, that is me as the researcher, my experience of taking DPT and also my observation of how students did DPT. So there are two categories of the questions. Q1 to Q4 are about operation and the other part are related to the suitability, 10 questions there. Now, here's the one, okay. Since the uh, freshmen were uh, in the lab for the, uh, com uh, the computer work, and they mostly did this test in the computer. However, if they've experienced any kind of problem or the computer didn't work properly, then they were moved to smartphone. And as you can see from all the results here, the number shows the number of the students. However, in the middle of the box or the bar, you can see the percentage and you can see the uh, comparison of the uh, percentage of the participants' responses. Now, the second question is, did they encounter any problem? Well, most of them did not, but still some. Number three, the operation with the device is easy. Well, it seems that almost, almost, okay, all of them had the positive feedback about this. Question four is about dragging the answer. Okay, now if that is the computer using mouse to drag the answer, that is easy for them. However, if that is about the smartphone, that is another story. As to the suitability, this question asked about the instruction in the DPT. Again, positively uh, answered by the students. 
the layout of the test. Okay, now it could be uh, evenly distributed that uh, students agree that the layout is fine. And question number three is about the words on the screen are easy to read, similarly to the previous one, isn't it? Then the question, question number four, about the quality of the listening passages. Well, it's also positive here. Now, the one for the time bar on the top of the screen, which is a reminder for the students. Well, almost all of them, okay, almost all of them agreed that it is helpful. Now, in this question about the speed of the audio clips well could they catch up with the speed yeah again you can see students tend to have good uh speed following and next one which style of answering was the easiest well for the click and for the drag of course click would be much easier compared to dragging question eight which part seemed to be challenging to you and very easy, you can see unscrambled words, that's fine. The unscrambled dialogue content and reading comprehension, these two parts required students' comprehension and also their cognition. And of course, it is understandable that these two parts are challenging for students. Question nine. Did you have the bonus questions? As I said, that students might have the uh, chance to answer more questions as bonus because the system was unable to decide which level the students should be placed. Do you think the test matches your English level? Well, we would say um, almost four fifth of the students agree that that matches their English level. So my conclusion is that overall the participating students show positive feedback toward the use of DPT. Uh, this could be shown from that adaptive questions are presented fitting the students level. So if your answers are correct, your questions might be a little bit higher than your level. But if your answers are not correct, then you might be led to the easier one. And it is affordable. Any place, any time, and any device can be done. Uh, even um, instead of this, we can also say the money is also affordable. It is cheaper compared to most of the other types of proficiency test. It is user-friendly and good quality. So easy to operate with time reminder and the trial session before the test, instruction and listening. These are good quality here. The instruction is clear, the listening quality is good. And then we also provide the trial session before the test. Now time saving, okay, 30 minutes or so, and instant feedback the result can be seen from the Sefer band graph. And that is also a certificate to please the students and let them know what their strengths are and what their uh, weaknesses are. Excuse me. OK. Now, in short, I have some suggestions for Clarity English for this work. The first one, well, that is the triangle, as you can see here, for the certificate. First one is to provide the graph interpretation for teachers and also for students. And the second one is that there could be some possibility of further design for assessments in productive skills like uh, oral test and written test. And I know that uh, I was told by Kima, the salesperson or the sales, the the representative of the dealer, okay, that this could be done and it could be one of the plans to do in the near future. So before we wrap up, would you like to see, you still remember the nine words about DPT? 30 seconds for you.
Now, if you can get the nine words, I would say you are really brilliant, smart viewers. Okay. And of course, this design is completely different from the one we did in the very beginning. So that's it for my talk. And thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Antonia. All right, that's pretty much all of the presentations today. Hope you enjoy those sessions. Uh, due to uh, the technological issues earlier, uh, there are less time for Q&A than is uh, But we will firstly invite the key man, Adrian, to, to answer Antonia's question about the assessment of the productive skills in DPT first. After that, we may have uh, one or two more questions. Uh, Adrian? Uh, thank you, and thank you to Antonia. This, the, th this really is a key question um, about whether we can introduce uh, productive skill testing into dynamic placement tests. So on, on the one hand, you have the advantages of dynamic placement tests. It's quick. Uh, it's affordable, um, it's auto-marked, it's got an instant response, um, it's accurate, so everything, all of Sean's work and Telk's work has gone into it, um, and we know that what you come out of it is a correct CEFR grade. Now, we have within the, um, within the test, there's, we, we call it receptive plus or plus plus. There are some, some question types like dialogue rearranging where you are beginning to engage the bit of your brain which starts working with productive skills um, when you're starting to drag items around to complete a dialogue. And at the moment, really, that's, that's the best we can get to with the state of AI um, and uh, you know, making sure that what we're doing is correct uh, and accurate. Um, that's as far as we go. As Sean was saying earlier, there is a correlation between receptive and productive skills. Um, it may be a weak correlation, but we can be confident that um, it, when we say that at the end of the test, you'll be to, then your speaking level isn't going to be very different. Now, now I do know that, especially in Taiwan, um, and especially for speaking even more than writing, there is a, uh, a demand for an element of speaking. And, and we're, we're looking to see how that can be done. And the more that you have uh, a need or ideas about this, and you you can talk to Kima, uh, give Kima your email and start talking about this. The more likely we are to be able to say, okay, well, let's see if we can you know, add an extension or, or find some other way to link to um, some form of doing um, speaking tests. So that's, that's my answer from DPT. Sean, do you want to jump in there as well? Well, uh, <clears throat> I would like to mention something, Adrian. You talked about the uh, advantages of the DPT, right? Um, don't forget uh, to add uh, validity, reliability, and comparability on there. Um, especially, I mean, uh, of course, in test development, we talk about validity and reliability, but really very important because we put a lot of work into this, Adrian, haven't we, into comparability. So if you get a B2 in uh, the DPT, you're probably gonna get a B2 in uh, other tests. And, and we've actually proven that. So don't forget that DPT is absolutely reliable uh, in comparison with other tests. Uh, as far as the, um, the correlation between productive and, and receptive skills, I think uh, what you said, Adrian, there is a weak correlation. However, you're absolutely right. If you get a C1, in your receptive skills, then your speaking and writing are probably going to be plus minus, right? I mean, that's that's what we're looking at. So, of course, if you have a C1 in listening and reading, you're not going to have an A1 in speaking, but you're probably going to be at worst in the B range. 
so that would be my my uh, addition to that. Okay, thank you, Andrew and Sean. And for the rest of time, probably we can go over one to two more questions. Uh, allow me to share my uh, desktop. And for the first question, how to run EMI class if the uh, the English level of the students are of B1 or below? Please share the relevant and effective method. Uh, I was wondering, Sean, can you help to answer the question? That's a problem. Uh, I, I recognize the problem, and, and I think we've all experienced it, where you have a classroom, uh, some students are very motivated, and their language level is very high, and then you have a, a few students who are, are level B1 or below, they get very frustrated, uh, they're very disruptive, you have to slow the class down, and, and then you're dealing with conflicting groups. I think that's a tough one, and I really, especially in academia, I mean, we're not talking about a, an English learning class, I think we're talking about a, an academic class. I think it's really important to deal with the problem beforehand to get everybody at level before they join the class. Once they're sitting all there, I think you have to make some tough choices. Are you gonna go slow uh, and, and really leave the good students out, get them bored, or are you gonna go fast? Another option is to pair, which I think Tom, you talk about a lot, is to pair weak students with uh, strong students and get them to help each other. And even if you're working with a weak student, you're also learning on that. Maybe Tom could add to that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Sean, thanks. Um, you know, also it, it's, it's important to say that when we're teaching a, a subject rather than a language, people are often at a low level in that subject when they start. So for example, if we're teaching um, a science, you may have very low level chemists learning chemistry. And of course you start low and build up. And similarly, I think when teaching a subject in, in a language, that's also true that we can start at low levels. So we can start teaching at a B1 or below even and build up with the students, both their actual knowledge of the subject and their, their language level at the same time. So to be honest, Absolutely, I think we've yeah. all done that, haven't we? You know, so yeah. yeah. You make that's, progress that's with them and then you, you motivate them with the progress they've made and you can show them, demonstrate how they're improving as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a real key thing because, you know, students are perfectly able to learn, you know, a low language level is no indication of being stupid as we all know. Um, you know, I, I've got a low language level in a variety of languages. Um, I, I'm also stupid. That's not a very good example. But what I mean is, you know, you can have a low language level, but also be a proficient learner. Um, so building those two skills, as in the, the content and the language at the same time, is perfectly possible. Okay. Uh, all right. I think that's about the time. Um, thank you all again for joining us. Uh, to this webinar today and hope you find those two hours uh, informative and rewarding and everybody have a good one and i'll say goodbye and for all of the speakers including andrew and puyi would you please stay for a moment thank you bye everyone thanks so much bye. Thanks so thank much. you for joining thanks us everyone. bye and thanks Take for joining care. the chat guys that was really useful <laughs>